So hello there guys and welcome back to a brand new episode of the DNF1 F1 podcast. I hope that you guys are doing well and I hope that you're staying safe as always wherever you are listening to this show around the world and of course if you are tuning in during the bank holiday May Day of course I hope you guys are enjoying the long weekend. hope it's been nice and restful and I hope that you are enjoying this podcast I suppose that's all I can really say and uh, thank you of course as always to Uh, all of you that choose to listen to this show, whether you listen to us on your favourite pod platform or whether you watch this on YouTube. And of course, if you are new and you're tuning into us at DNF1 for the very first time, make sure to subscribe to the channel. If you watch us on YouTube, like the video as always, or if you are listening to us on your favourite pod platform, make sure to send us a nice five-star review. It really helps out the podcast a lot. And of course, we can't do this without your support. So thank you very much to everyone who chooses to support us. Of course, we give shout outs to five star reviews, but you do have to let us know on our socials. So get in touch if you've done that. Send us a screenshot. Say, yeah, we've given you a five star review, guys. Give us a shout out. We'll be happy to oblige on a future episode. But now, of course, first race back following the first interlow period in the F1 season. And it was a huge weekend for what we can no doubt argue now is the undisputed king of the streets Sergio Perez responding in emphatic fashion proving why he is the king of the streets by winning not only the main race on Sunday but also the sprint race as well on Saturday afternoon maximum points for Sergio Perez minus the fastest lap of course takes him now within a victory of his teammate Max Verstappen in the championship. Now six points behind his teammate in the driver's championship. And I don't know about you guys, I was a little bit concerned about Checo Perez. I felt that from what we saw in Melbourne, albeit the issue he had wasn't his fault, it did seem like the cogs were starting to turn and this championship may already start to be getting away from him. But Sergio proving us all wrong and getting the W in a big way and really sending a message to his two-time world champion team teammate Max Verstappen that he very much is in this fight but of course we'll have to wait and see how that pans out in our next race in Miami next weekend but talking about this race with me and all the events that happened across F1's first sprint weekend of 2023 under the north new format of course we have Lee Wallington the DNF1 panel member joining me this evening Lee first of all Hope you well, mate. And what did you make of F1's first sprint weekend in Baku? Yeah, I'm good. Thank you, Adam. Um, well, I enjoyed the race. Obviously, firstly, I got my ball prediction correct. So I'm very happy with that. Two out of four so far this season. So that's a very good track record. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was a it was a really entertaining race or races, if you include the sprint race. So I I I was Oh, yeah, I was entertained. It was what we want, and so was close racing. Um, I, it, I was very pleased. Well, seeing as we've brought this up, let's talk about the sprint weekend. Now, as you guys know, if you've been listening to this show or if you've been following the F1 news, you would know that F1 have recently changed the sprint format to having a extra qualifying session for the sprint race separate from the entire weekend. And of course, the main change was that the results from the sprint race would no longer determine the grid for Sunday. So in a way, it was a bit more of a traditional weekend, but then of course with an extra sprint session and an extra sprint race to go along with that, something separate. And I'd imagine there's probably going to be a mixed reaction to this. Um, Lee, what did you make of the first sprint weekend under the new format? Do you think it was uh, considered a success or do you think there's room for improvement? I think from the Formula One perspective, I think they'll probably consider it a success, or well, although it does need some refinement. Um, I still personally don't think having the main events qualifying on the Friday is great for fans because fans will miss that. Um, and secondly, I do, if, especially if you're a casual follower of the sport, I think you may find it confusing that you've got qualifying for Friday or on Friday for the main event, you have qualifying for Saturday. And then when you get to the actual sprint race, you're a bit confused about which qualifying is going to the sprint race. And you know, they didn't need to qualify that yesterday. And it's, so I don't think having qualifying and qualifying and then race race is probably the best format. I think they may need to look at the order of how they do the events. Um, because I think that would probably be go down better with um the fan base. Um 
but overall, I think it was definitely an improvement over last year. Yeah, one driver in particular who has not been a fan of the sprint format already, let alone the new one, is world champion Max Verstappen. And, you know, he was saying that, you know, qualifying on the Friday was fine. You get into the normal rhythm that you do with qualifying and then, you know, you go and do that. And then, of course, you wake up on Saturday and then you do another qualifying session. And he said that he felt a little bit bored about the idea of doing that. He just felt that he didn't really add much value to it. Then, of course, you had the sprint race. And, you know, for different reasons, Max would have had his own thoughts on how that sprint race went down in particular. And then, of course, you know, he's a very much a traditionist in this regard. He pretty much is only concerned about the main race on Sunday. And, of course, as the centerpiece of the F1 weekend, it should always remain that way. But I totally understand where he's coming from. I completely understand where you're coming from in this. And, you know, people that listen to this show will know that I've never always been the biggest backer of the sprint events, but I do feel there is some value to them. I just wasn't a fan of what we saw this weekend. And it, it does boil down mostly to how it's been structured with qualifying. I, Annoying as it sounds, I prefer the old sprint format where the results from the sprint race added a you know an element to Sunday's race I think if you're going to have a sprint weekend or something different it should offer that difference rather than just becoming something completely separate and almost redundant to certain people further down the order and you know the qualifying element as well the sprint shootout in a way uh, based on what we saw on Friday I think it was rather predictable what we were going to get in qualifying on the Saturday morning as well so I don't know I, I'm not sure It had the anticipated uh, welcome or result that they were probably hoping for when they look back on this. There's definitely room for improvement. I I think, you know, we can kind of look at a few issues in particular, one of which is the Park Ferme issues. And, you know, from Park Ferme, that's going to be set in stone from Friday qualifying in the evening. And whilst some people may say, well, that, you know, creates a bit of opportunity for some people who have got their car set up rather well compared to others who haven't to make some ground or get an advantage there. I often feel that, given especially by what happened on Friday with Pierre Gasly's um, Alpine blowing up, it really did hurt a lot of people. Carlos Sainz in particular, I think his weekend was compromised despite the fact that he got some decent results anyway by the fact that he couldn't optimise his setup. I know Ocon... Hulkenberg, both of those guys had to start from the pit lane for that reason. They had to change their setups in park fair making distance. So I do feel that there is room to be t- uh, to tweak these regulations. Um, I'm, I'm going to read a quote out from former Hassan Mercedes uh, strategist and engineer Mike Caulfield, who we've had on the show in the past. He's wrote on Twitter on his uh, on his page, Mike Caulfield F1. My change would be to have sprint quality Friday evening. Sprint race Saturday morning, so it's totally different conditions to the race, and then quali in the usual spot on a Saturday afternoon. Then have Park Ferme for the sprint, but open it back up again for qualifying for the main race. So I think there that is not a bad idea, to be fair. I mean, if I was going to have it the way that it is right now in terms of what is going to be included in a sprint weekend, I probably would favour that format more, purely and simply because... What we ended up seeing in sprint quality in the sprint race league is a lot of teams that couldn't score points using it as an opportunity to have a bit of a practice session in the middle of a race. The only problem with that is it just provides them with data and it doesn't allow them the opportunity to change the setup on their cars without the penalty of starting at the back of the grid, which is what Ocon and Hulkenberg did, for example. So, um, I mean, what were your thoughts on all that? Would, Would you agree with that change or did you have anything else in mind that you would prefer? I would completely agree with that change. I think that will help the drivers obviously the engineers always love more data but help the drivers having the, the ability and the choice to change their car outside of the the main event and obviously spin race but also that order as i refer to having the qualifying race qualifying race is better than qualifying qualifying race race um i would also propose an additional change is that instead of having it back to back in the same week, race weekend, yes, it adds more expenses and travel, so maybe you look at budgeting and blah, blah, blah. It's only a, 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 a um, long shot idea anyway, I doubt it would ever happen, is you have a sprint race as a standalone one-day event and you go to a circuit that's um, just going to throw East Temple Park out there, for example. East Temple Park, one-day event, there you go. Your sprint race, sprint qualifying, sprint race, that's it. You don't have a main event, let's just 
a new track, different conditions, different. Pre- it's not predictable. And if you want, you give an extra trophy at the end that you're a sprint champion, which is not as important as the world champion, but it's still another trophy you throw about. Uh, yeah, I don't know what you think on that one. It's not a bad idea. I like where you're going with that. I think a lot of people that might like the idea of having a separate championship for the sprint and, you know, to sort of, if you want to go one step further and separate that as an entity from the the main race over the weekend, some people may say, oh, it's just another opportunity to give the bigger teams an extra chance to celebrate some silverware, if you like. And, you know, there's there's those other elements to it. When you have a meritocracy like you have in Formula One, which I still think is the best way to do things. I don't like the idea of artificial reverse grids and all the other stuff that come with it to try and equal out the field. And this is what Max Verstappen was saying as well. He, he was basically saying F1's main priority should be to try and close up the deficit between the fastest teams and the slowest teams as much as possible so that almost everybody has a realistic chance of trying to get a big result or even win a Grand Prix. I don't think many of us are going to complain with that. But I also agree that you can't really do that by having a single chassis series like you have with F2 or F3 or, you know, W Series, F1 Academy, all the others. You need to try and do it in the form of a meritocracy. So there's a lot to go there. I must admit, I did like the, uh, what was it, the prizes or the little plaques that the drivers received in the top three. I thought that was nice. The sprint shootout pole award for Charles Leclerc who got pole position in the main race and the sprint quali race he absolutely loves Baku as well so you know good stuff from him he got very interesting Pirelli hat that was uh, sparkling on different colors so I get it what they're trying to do I am very much in favor of what Mike suggested regarding the changes to the weekend format and the main issue that I think we saw at first hand and we kind of anticipated would happen over the course of the weekend was the tyre controversy in the sprint shootout with Lando Norris. Now, for those of you that aren't aware, the sprint shootout, the new quality format for the sprint race, has specific rules where they have mandated tyres for each session. So Q1 and Q2, you're only allowed to use one set of medium tyres. It has to be a new set. And of course, in Q3, you have to use a brand new set of soft tyres. Now, because the sprint quality session was after the main qualifying session for the main race on Sunday, what ended up happening was there was a potential risk that if Lando Norris and Yuki Tsunoda both qualified in Q3, neither of them would be able to take part because they'd used up all of their soft tyre from their allocations on Friday in the main qualifying session. It wasn't going to be a very good race tyre because they learned that in the sprint while it wasn't going to be a good race tyre anyway. We saw that firsthand from Norris in particular. And what ended up happening was Lando Norris qualified in Q3 and he couldn't take part because he didn't have any fresh softs left. And for me... That was very much a bit of an own goal from F1 and the FIA on those regulations. And I think this kind of empowers the decision or the the thought process, if you like, to move sprint quality to Friday instead of having it after the main qualifying session. Because at least if you do that, you don't have to change the rules on sprint quality. You don't have to bring any extra tyres like they used to have. Like someone said, oh, maybe they should have a fresh set of sots available to every single driver in the top 10 logistically that would just be an absolute mess and it would go against F1's aims to be carbon neutral by 2030 or carbon zero if they're like if they're just using more creating a larger carbon footprint to transport another 10 sets of soft tires around um for the and they wouldn't even be able to be 10 it'd be 22 because or or 20 sorry because they wouldn't know who's going to be in the top 10 so they have to make sure everybody has a fresh set available to them in case the off chance that one of them gets in there when they're not supposed to be. You can't just have 10 sets because it takes forever to sort of distribute them all out to each driver. So, um, yeah, I I think going forward, that would be the best solution in my opinion. Move the sprint quality session to a Friday if you want to persist with it. Have the sprint race on a, sat- uh, on a Saturday morning. I like that. Open up Park Ferme again and then do it on Saturday and Sunday. I think that would be a good way of doing it. It doesn't change too much either. And... I don't think it's going to take anything away from what F1 and the FIA would want from this sprint series is an opportunity for some guys further down without the added burden of pit stops to try and make some places up through the field and score a few points where they may not have done in the main race. Yeah, I I, I do agree with that, and especially the the um, tyre situation with Lando. I think it could have been a lot worse. Um, originally, when I heard that Lando couldn't partake or Yuki can partake but obviously he didn't make it I was thinking Indianapolis when there was the six car race 
Um, you could just, uh, or I was sort of qualifying, not the same, but you just imagine if it had been such a big own goal that there's only four cars got through and still had new soft tyres, how stupid yeah. it would have looked for the first sprint qualifying for Q3. And, uh, so, yeah, I, they really need to revise that what rule. Yeah, well, I mean, we'll have to wait and see what they do on this one. It was always going to be an experiment. I don't think we should throw the baby out with the bathwater just yet. But let us know, guys, on your thoughts for the sprint weekend that we just had. Do you like the new format? What would you, would you like to change anything about it? And of course, what did you make of the entire controversy in the sprint shootout with Landon Norris in particular, which prevented him from taking part? Let's move back now, Lee to the main race the big headline this weekend Sergio Perez winning not only the sprint race but also the main race and you know it must be said that there were certain mitigating circumstances for his teammate Max Verstappen of course he had that damage from that incident with George Russell which of course we'll talk about a little bit later on in the sprint race really compromised his performance because it was a huge hole in his side pod that he had to race with and the main race of course with a safety car really compromising him because he'd gotten himself into the lead. The safety car came out. It benefited Perez, which got him out in front. But then after that, Perez pretty much had the race under his control. And, you know, a a lot of people, us included, probably already wrote Sergio Perez off from this Drivers' Championship. And yet, once again, Sergio Perez has come out emphatically on the streets to win quite dominantly in some regards as well, in a Red Bull, which is in a league of its own already, over his teammate. For me, that really does send a huge message to his teammate in that if Max is not 100% on his A game, as we often expect him to be, Sergio Perez is going to be there to pick up the pieces. And this championship is very much on at the moment. Yeah, well, I think uh, Sergio said it better. I'm just paraphrasing that if it wasn't for the issue, technical issue that he caused his um, retirement in Melbourne, or obviously the... In, during the qualifying, was it not qualifying? I can't remember when he retired in Melbourne. Yeah, it was, in, it was qualifying, wasn't it, where you had yeah. that accident and it caused him to start down the back of the field. Um, but if it wasn't because of that technical issue, he would actually be leading the championship. Even if Max won and Sergio had finished second, um, he would be leading the championship from the point difference from finishing P5 to P2. He would be leading it by one point at this moment. So that just shows you how much he's actually in it at the moment. Um, which is very impressive because, as you said, we had written him off. We could still be written off later in the season, but he's doing a lot better than last year. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, for those of you wondering or keeping score, this is Checo's fifth win with Red Bull, if you don't include sprint races. They've all been on street circuits, however. You know, he had Baku 21. That was his first win for the team there. Monaco last season, Singapore last season, Jeddah this season, and of course, Baku this season. Sheko was saying it's two and a half victories at Baku. The first driver, of course, to win the Baku race in uh, on two separate occasions. As I said, Perez, Perez saying two and a half there winning the sprint race. I think we'll give him that because it was very impressive there. The point I'm trying to make here, Lee, is that whilst right now we're sitting there praising Checo, deservedly praising Checo because he was phenomenal this weekend, outstanding stuff. And it really does bode well for this championship. Whilst we do have more street circuits on the Canada, we're going to another one next week in Miami. I'm worried that whilst we're getting excited right now, we're overlooking one clear fact. And that is Checo's wins or big performances in this team have all come at street circuits. What does he do now that we're going to be going to other circuits, more regular traditional circuits where Max Verstappen often excels. Because if Checo's going to win this championship, or at least take it to Max all the way across the season, he has to be much stronger and get some wins at those circuits too. Well, um, I'll say this in jest, but the first thing that comes to mind is just think that every circuit has a wall around it and it just becomes a street circuit. <laughs> well, I mean, if Liberty Media had their way, they probably would have an entire championship of street circuits and then Checo would just dominate the field like prime Max Verstappen or Lewis Hamilton ever did before him. So, but that's not going to happen anytime no. soon. Um, yeah, they, they obviously, it's, it's stepping up in the game, obviously. One of the things that Sergio has the advantage over Max in street circuits is obviously his tyre management. Um, you're hearing in the race that about uh, Max was complaining about the tyre, especially on the first stint where um, before obviously the safety car. Um and so still, we've always said that Sergio just do it's one of his strengths. So in a normal circuit situation, 
obviously the right angle corners aren't as common, but it's just staying with it with max possible. You just need a safety car, red flag, where where weather conditions, which we still have um, this season. Obviously, the full freeze and um, an opportunity moments come along. It's he just has to stick there um, and obviously not be third. So he needs to be second, second, second. Or obviously, we'll need to win as well. But it's consistency is key um, for a championship bid. Uh, and it's something Sergio has struggled with consistently through the season to maintain the bid. So winning two races is great, but obviously the consistency to maintain that um, throughout the season is going to be where I think the biggest improvement that Sergio will need to do. Yeah. No, I agree. I think I think what we're seeing, though, based on what we saw this weekend, there is a growing belief in Sergio Perez. And we saw this in Jeddah as well, because people can throw factors or caveats into play here as to why Max Verstappen was not able to get the win over his teammate, as we so often expect him to do. Such issues like Max was complaining on the radio about some engine diff issues um, that obviously were affecting him out of the slower corners. The issue he had yesterday with George Russell on the side pod, the damage there. Obviously, the performance was lacking in that car because of that issue. And, you know, not only it prevented him from finding his teammate, he wasn't able to get ahead of Charles Leclerc in that race either. So, you know, that was something. And I do feel that Checo's confidence is growing in this battle. As I said already, if F1 was a championship full of street circuits, Checo would be my odds-on favourite to win. That being said he will have to show now that he's able to do this other circuits as well. If he can do that and it starts to get into his teammate's head because, you know, let's be honest, Max Verstappen's a great driver, but he's very easily rattled. And I do feel sometimes that can affect him. You know, he's very good at driving whilst he's, you know, hot under the collar and he's feeling angry and stuff. We hear him on the radio half the time moaning about this or moaning about that, even when things are going swimmingly well. He's still able to drive phenomenally brilliantly regardless of that. But I do think there is an element there where if Checo can, in a nice way, from a competitive standpoint, get under his skin. I'm not trying to suggest that Checo should be, you know, playing foul or dirty or do anything manipulative here. But if he can get, you know, if his performances can really send a message to his teammate and that other side of the garage that he's here to play, he's here to fight in this championship, and he produces the results and performances to back that up, like he's done today, like he did in Jeddah, there's absolutely no reason in my mind why this could not be a all-time classic championship fight. And who knows? It could be Checo Gier. We'll have to wait and see. But uh, right now, things look pretty, pretty good if you're Sergio Perez or a fan of Sergio Perez in particular. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely taken the the step up um, compared to previous seasons. And it, you're right, it needs to be about sending that message to Max. He, um, and not just Max, but the Red Bull team that obviously he's capable of racing Max and um, taking it and to obviously let them race, which is obviously going to be the key key things you don't you want them to, Red Bull management to go, no, this is it. We don't want anyone racing. We don't. We want Max to be champion. So you don't challenge. And it's that's the the last thing we probably want from a uh, fan perspective. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, should we talk about the incident between Max and George? Seeing as we've uh, gotten to Max in particular, so obviously for the for those of you that weren't following the sprint race at the uh, very beginning of it, Max Verstappen and George Russell had a bit of a collision at turn two early on which caused Max to have some damage to his side pod on his left side and f- some floor damage as well and of course they nearly came together again at turn three at the end of it George Russell trying his hardest Max was able to win out in the end but it very much compromised Max Verstappen's performance and it was you know an incident which really enraged Max Verstappen to the point where he pulled George Russell up at the end of the race to have uh, an exchange of words with him I'm not going to repeat what he said on the show uh, because I want to keep this clean and family friendly, but uh, he wasn't best pleased with George Russell in particular. George gave his reasons, which of course we'll get into in a minute. But Lee, I want to ask for your thoughts on this incident. How did you see it? Because the stewards didn't penalise the drivers, even though there was room for them to consider doing that. They didn't even investigate it. Well, they sort of did, but then said no further action required. So uh, what were your thoughts on that incident? For me, I think that was a reasonable um I would take the gap was there. 
George was reasonably alongside going into turn two. Yes, it's a shame that the damage or contact was made and damage was caused to Max's car. But at the same time, Max should know that he's got a superior car. His DRS is really good. And we we, we praised him in our, um, another um, race where he's, he was being mature and thinking, All right, I'll get this driver next time. I'll get, I'll come back. But instead of um, not saying, obviously, the, the race he's got to concede, but just to think about, okay, George, you've got this, but I'm going to get you down the back straight. I'll get you in two two laps when I've got my DRS and I'll just breeze past you because I'm over 20 kilometers an hour faster than you. <laughs> this isn't in a, a race um, for for me to be concerned about. Um, and I'm just going to show an example with we saw in the main event with Carlos and Fernando. Fernando went down the inside. Um, Carlos pushed Carlos a bit wide, but Carlos conceded and they both went on to race with no damage. That's how I think the event um, turn two could have gone is George was down the inside. Um, going around the outside is more dangerous, more riskier, and especially Max is at the championship to think about. He should have conceded and come back um, to George. And, they, and he, he could have changed Sergio for the win and um, actually got past Charles without that damage. Yeah, I mean, Max was kind of caught in a difficult position where he was compromised on the exit of turn one because, you know, Perez tried to get close to Leclerc and obviously that Constantino effect that happens after that bogged Max down to the point where George had an opportunity where he tried to get past him. Now, I completely agree with you. I, I'm i glad the stewards decided that it was um, not necessarily a racing incident, but I felt that there wasn't really one driver you could lay enough of the blame on to a proportion that would warrant a penalty. Now, I know Max Verstappen and, and Max Verstappen fans won't be happy to hear me say that and probably would think differently, and it's totally understandable. However, I do feel that with this particular incident that both drivers did have an air of responsibility to it that neither really honoured to the degree that would have allowed them to get through it cleanly. And Max, unfortunately, was the um, the injured party, if you like. If you're talking about his car, he was the one that took the damage. Um, you know, these things happen sometimes. What I want to focus on with this particular incident is, is those two sides of where I felt George and Max could have been better. And the first of which, let's talk about you know, let's talk about Max since we're talking about him at the moment. We've said countless times in the past that Max Verstappen is an almost perfect driver, but I do feel that the one issue that he has in his driving, and this is something that, whilst he's in the best car right now, is not going to come up very, very often, but in the future, if Red Bull are more competitive, uh, or sorry, not Red Bull, more competitive, if other teams are more competitive where they can challenge Red Bull for race wins, like we saw in 2021, for example. We didn't see a lot of it in 2022, necessarily between uh, Verstappen and, and Leclerc in particular. Those two were challenging each other. They were quite more respectful. But one thing that Max Verstappen often struggles to do is I feel give his rival enough room when they're in a situation where they may get the move on him. Max doesn't like to let some of these overtakes go. He doesn't like to be overtaken, not that anybody does, but he really doesn't like to be overtaken to the point where sometimes, you know, and I'm not going to mention examples with, I know some people think, oh, I'm going to bring up an incident with Sir Lewis Hamilton. I'm, I'm not, because I know it's very easy to go there and open up that can of worms again. But I think from what we saw yesterday in the sprint, there was scope for Max to give George a little bit more room because George had warranted space where he had to go around that corner through the inside. George was not going to disappear, nor should he. But sometimes I feel that if Max was on the inside, he'd have done the exact same thing that George did and would have warranted the room and say, well, I'm on the inside. You know, you can't, you know, you can't imagine I'm not going to be there. So... I did feel that there was enough room on the outside where Max could have opened up the corner a little bit because George had warranted the race in Rome, he has to give him the space. He didn't, and it was a bit tight, and he got a bit of damage. Now, whilst that's easy to say with Max, and I do think that's a fair point. You can disagree with me if, if you want to, Max fans. I'm sorry, but I, I do feel that is a trend of Max that he does need to be more considerate of. Even though I agree with you, Lee, he has matured a lot in that he does 
sometimes he chooses to fight a certain battle like we saw at the beginning of the race today. He didn't try to send one up the inside of Declare because he knew he'd get him in a few laps and he ultimately did. Um, that's the more mature side of Max that we have seen a lot more recently. And, you know, that's a good thing. Now that we talk about George Russell, for example, I think George's problem is when he goes for a lunge sometimes around the inside or an opportunistic move where you have to react in a split of a second to make it work. Otherwise, you have to pull out or it's going to be chaos. Sometimes I think George lacks a little bit of finesse and control. And the obvious example to you know prove this point was in Cota when he hit Carlos Sainz. He did the same thing in Imola a couple of years ago with Bottas when he tried to overtake him when he was in the Williams. He completely misjudged that and took them two out of the race. And I do feel that when I looked at the replays, when it was all slowed down, George did not outbreak himself that much, but he did go in a little bit hotter than he probably could have done. And if he was a little bit slower, he could have, you know, maneuvered the angle a bit better to avoid contact with Max. I get it. It's an opportunity and he's being aggressive. And, and by George Russell's own admission that he said the tyres were cold, I didn't have much grip, which annoyed Max. And I think it's understandable because if you haven't got that much grip, you have to be considerate for that. You can't just expect the guy on the outside, especially on a street circuit, to disappear. And that's where you had contact between the two. So, you know, all of that aside, guys, to summarise the long point I was making on both drivers, there is room for both of them here to try and acknowledge that there were some fault on their part. To, on this incident and in the future it's something that they do need to work on in future incidents because it's not the first time these two have done this and have had incidents not necessarily with each other but with other drivers so you know make of that what you will um Lee did you have any more final thoughts on that particular incident before we move on um I was just going to quickly uh, add two things firstly it was about George I do agree um I think he should look back at Honey Badger's Daniel Ricardo prime overtakes when late on the brakes and I think uh, George needs to uh, learn from Danny Rick in that aspect because he was brilliant at doing those at, in his um, prime not in the McLaren days obviously um, but also at the end there uh, when Max confronted George um, Max is a role model to young drivers to young fans growing up watching the sport Max fans and non-Max fans will be looking at him as, well, this is this is my world champion or not my world champion. This is who you grew up watching regardless. Um, and I think a, a degree of, um, I know he was, hot, he was hot-headed and annoyed at that time but with the language used, but he should have said it off camera or I want to speak to you later. Um, I, I don't think it's uh, acceptable from a world champion to have that kind of attitude on live TV. And you, you see it in the past with Charles Leclerc where he's been annoyed at, and he's like, no, I'm going to speak to speak to him after this. I'm not going to say anything. I'm not going to say anything on camera. I'm not going to, I know it was a private conversation, but the camera was there. Um, so yeah, I just, I just feel like uh, Max need, needs to think about who he is. He is the world champion. He is the number one in the sport. Um, he represents the sport to the world, the fans, children um, who grow up like we did in the, the 90s watching Michael Schumacher or Damon Hill or Jax Villeneuve or um, Mika Hacken. It's that kind of um, thing you need to you need to think about. And I, uh, that's just my last point. And it's obviously I'm not uh, I'm not try accusing him of anything like that. I just saying he should be considerate of. No, I, I think that's a fair point because look, Anybody that's done karting or any racing of any degree and was involved in an incident like that and they felt that they were wrong, wrongly done by, of course, naturally, your first emotion is going to be anger or discontent or, in this case, rage, if you like. And whilst it's easy for us to sit here and say, oh, Max is a role model, he needs to behave better and conduct himself better with this, blah, blah, blah. George Russell just tried to argue his point respectfully and then just walked away when it got very heated and, like, he wanted to take himself out of the situation... It's like easy for us to say that, but yeah. you do have to be mindful that there are cameras, there are microphones. And look, I'm not suggesting here that Max is a hothead or he does this all the time and stuff like that. I'm sure he's a very lovely guy when you, you, you're, he's in his own space and he's with people he's comfortable with. That's fine. But I do agree. You do have to conduct yourself a little bit better in these situations and have a private chat 
Don't pull him up in the middle of the paddock where everyone can see what's going on and make yourself out to be the bad guy. You know, and George has been on the other side of this as well when he tried to confront Valtteri and Imola after that. And, you know, upon reflection, he looked really foolish over it and he acknowledged that. So, and this isn't the first time Max has been involved in something like this. We all remember Interlagos a few years ago with Esteban Ocon, that particular incident. Um, it, it wasn't his best moment. We all remember, well, some of us more than others will remember in 98 in Spa where Michael Schumacher ran into the back of Coulthard because you know, he couldn't see him. And it ruined his race and arguably his 98 championship. And he went in there and wanted to fight David Coulthard. And people will say to me, oh, well, you're a Schumacher fan. Would you condone that? I'm like, probably. But I was six. So, you know, I feel like I've matured a bit more since then. And um, you're right. You know, these are the messages you've got to try and send to other, other young fans watching this sport. And there are many more of them now that these sorts of scuffles, whilst we all love a bit of drama, it's not the sort of thing you want to be doing out in public. So, uh yeah, it will be interesting, though, on a separate note, Lee, to see how all this sort of thing develops between Verstappen and Russell. Because I think Russell made an interesting comment that um, whilst he has a lot of respect for Max Verstappen, he doesn't want to give Max the impression that he's just going to give in every time they come together in a corner or look like it's going to be neck and neck. Because that's a precedent that George will need to set going forward with Max Verstappen when eventually they are fighting together on the track regularly for race wins and podiums and championships that he's not going to be a pushover. And you could argue that in the past, that was the way with Max and Lewis, where Max was very unforgiving with his driving style and Lewis just let him go. But then he got to the point where Lewis wasn't going to allow that anymore. And then the two of them collided together quite frequently. And uh, so I don't think George wants to set that kind of precedent with Max. I think he wants to let Max know he's not going to give up when they're alongside each other. Oh, yeah. It's I mean, it's a precedent to set. Um, and he's obviously thinking long-term that he's going to be fighting... Uh, Max for wins and championships. Um, so I fully understand George's perspective from that. And it just, you just have to look back to using another example of Lewis and Nico Rosberg. Um, that Nico would always let Lewis buy, Lewis buy, Lewis buy when challenged until Nico decided not to. And they made contact all times throughout the, the last years of their time together as teammates. Um, so yeah, so point that as a driver in a championship fight, you have to draw the line. George is drawing that line now. He's setting that precedent. Um, it's, um, it's say it's early or not. It's not his fight of Red Bull, but the, I, from his perspective, I, I think he's put the horse in the stable, so to speak. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but let us know your thoughts, guys, on that incident with Russell and Verstappen. Uh, let us know what you thought should have happened or who was at blame. If anyone was at blame, maybe it was a shared responsibility that we talked about earlier. Let's talk about Ferrari now. A very good weekend for Ferrari. Got to say, you know, I'm a Fer- I, everyone knows I'm a Ferrari fan. Very happy. This show. I am a very happy man. <laughs> uh, it's not the win, of course, but a good weekend for Ferrari. Can't really fault them at all this weekend. Charles Leclerc, to both pole positions in the sprint quality shootout and the main qualifying session absolutely loves it round Baku and a solid podium well two podiums if you like really a p2 in the sprint race p3 in the main race Charles Leclerc proven right now that he is probably the out and out fastest driver in Formula One right now pound for pound wise at least and in the race it was a clean race for him you know they had the safety car but it didn't compromise him like it did in Jeddah didn't have any reliability issues and he finally got that podium. Ferrari's first podium of the season, some big points as well to really get his and Ferrari's championship campaigns going on this weekend. And of course, let's not forget Carlos Sainz, P5 in both the sprint and the main race today, uh, this weekend, to pretty much cement by far Ferrari's best weekend of the season. Lee, how did you see Ferrari this weekend? Were you surprised at how impressive they were considering what we were expecting? I mean, I was a bit surprised in the one lap pace. Um, obviously, Carlos was improved over the last few ones as well. But Charles, oof, how he managed to put those two laps together and just watching both qualifying, it was really impressive to watch. It's like, oh, this is actually an exciting, tense qualifying. It's not just uh, Max going out there and being two tenths faster than Sergio. Um, this is really enjoyable, closest the hundredths in the in between the top three 
And so who's going to be on pole? It, for the first race of the season, I don't think you could have predicted who was going to be on pole um, because it was just so close and it was really enjoyable to to watch that. Um, but I really didn't expect Ferrari to be there. So reliability-wise, obviously, they had the good reliability, but they've obviously understood the car a bit better. Their upgrades have worked where well, they brought this weekend. Um, and just the step forward, right? one lap pace is one thing. Um, obviously, race paces are different, but there's still a, a, an improvement. I'm very happy to see them that start to build their season. It's only the fourth race. There's a long way to go. They could definitely uh, be fighting for race wins um, on their on their current trajectory, which is up. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, going into this weekend, Ferrari were languishing fourth in the Constructors' Championship, as right now they still are currently fourth, I believe, in the Constructors' Championship, unless I've read it wrong somewhere. Yeah. Um, but of course, yeah, so the fourth, they're a lot closer to Mercedes and Aston Martin, so they're back in this fight for P2 at least. And, you know, personnel like Laura Meeks, David Sanchez leaving the team, or at least Laura Meeks will be leaving the team very, very soon to replace Franz Toss at Alpha Tauri. And a lot of things change in a Ferrari, not necessarily for the better. And with everything going on right now, this was the perfect tonic to really give them that confidence boost, that morale boost to try and turn their season around. Now, of course, Ferrari would have had high hopes going into this season that they could have been challenging for the championship. I think we can all agree They've massively undelivered on that. Blindsided, if you like, by the fact that Red Bull have been so good and Aston Martin in particular have made a huge step forward to the point where they look the favourites for P2 at this point in time in the Constructors' Championship and arguably Red Bull's closest challenges if they get there. And this weekend we saw Charles Leclerc pretty much deliver what we come to expect from him, perhaps even more as well you know qualifying we always know Leclerc is very handy qualifying as has already said I believe right now he's the fastest pound for pound driver in Formula One over one lap at the moment in time he proved that this weekend with pole position at a track where he's been pole for the last three years in a row now I am not um I'm not Sean Kelly I'm not F1 stat man I have not got the stats with me to tell you whether or not that's the first time any driver has been on pole with three years in a row at the same circuit. Um, I'm sure so, I'm, maybe Michael Schumacher or Sir Lewis Hamilton has done it. I don't know. Or maybe Ayrton Senna. Um, Sean, if you are listening, you have to let me know. But that is still incredibly impressive. Bear in mind, this is a car right now that obviously its strongest trait is its one lap pace. But even then, it's still not necessarily great compared to the Red Bull, at least. But in the race as well, and in the sprint race, I think we kind of all expected the Ferrari pace to drop off. However, both Leclerc and Carlos Sainz as well, with a setup issues that he had, managed to deliver the one stop with a relative amount of ease, it must be said. Now, you know, subjectively, Ferrari will say, well, you know, we were concerned about it. We were managing our tyres and there was a lot of that going on. But the others were doing the same thing. And I think that more than anything else, Lee, is going to be very encouraging. On a surface that was relayed recently, so of course a lot of opportunity for people to uh, wreck their tyres if they weren't driving properly, but they managed it very well this weekend. I can't really say Ferrari have put together a weekend as clean and as good as this one in some time, to be honest. Yeah, well, on the tyre wear, I think the first three races, the tyre wear was really hurting Ferrari. So they made a step in that direction, but maybe it's um, the conditions. We don't know if to wait and see in Miami, but it feels like they made a step in how their their tire life. Um, and obviously you had Charles talking at the, the end there that he knew Fernando was conserving his tires for the attack at the, the end. So he did the same, um, which killed, um, counteracted Fernando's strategy. But the fact that Charles was able to do that and the tires hadn't gone regardless shows it's improvement compared to where they were in Bahrain. Um, where they just ate their tyres for breakfast. So that is already an improvement that we can physically see about the Ferrari. Um, and it, it just feels that the it's just a good improvement and a good base for the, the going into the, the uh, European season, depending where you put the line now, because obviously we go to Miami before we come back to Europe. Um, so it is still a very good start of the season and in the right direction. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, at one point towards the end of the race, he was matching the Red Bulls. And, you know, Max and Checo did point this out when they were looking for the telemetry that Leclerc's pace was very good at a point in the race where you did worry that Fernando Alonso was going to gobble him up. As it was, Leclerc built up quite a gap to Fernando and Fernando couldn't catch him towards the end. So very impressive stuff from Charles Leclerc. As I said with Carlos Sainz, you know, it's very easy for people to look at the qualifying pace. And we saw it here. Sprint qualifying, he was seven temps off Leclerc. He was eight temps off Leclerc in main qualifying, I believe. Of course, that is a problem. Setup issues alone aren't the only reason for that. Um, you know, Carlos does have to improve there. But overall in the race, he did a great job to keep Sir Lewis Hamilton behind him. All the while, it did seem that Hamilton was going to get him. Sainz managed to hold on to P5 in both races. So... You know, there's a lot of good reason for Ferrari to be happy right now. I think Leclerc pretty much summed it up by saying after the sprint race, he can't wait until Ferrari improve the car in the race pace, win races, and not only get pole positions. Now, with all the rumours going around regarding Leclerc's potential unrest with the team and concerns about his future as his contract is up at the end of next season, more weekends like this are going to be the perfect tonic for Charles Leclerc to not only commit his long-term future with Ferrari, which is, of course, Ferrari's main priority right now in terms of their driver lineup, but also the strongest vote of confidence to the commitment that he may want to make to this project where he still believes he can win a world championship with Ferrari. Yeah, it's definitely the the improvements that he needs to see from the team, obviously. He's still got a while yet on his contract, but I think the ball's all in Ferrari's court and that. He, they need to put their um, toys in the in the shop or what's available, whatever energy you want to use to show, look, this is what we can achieve together. This is what we can do to improve the car. This is what, uh, and not just um, set and actually act on it. So this is a step in the right direction, as I said. Um, and they just need to maintain the, the trajectory and give Charles confidence in the car and the team, which has really been hurt over the last uh, year and a and unfortunately, with his bad experience and bad luck and bad um, strategy decisions, and bad, it's just really at a low point in Ferrari. So it's a really good place to start building that back up. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, Ferrari have announced that they will be bringing more significant updates in Miami. So we'll have to wait and see how that works out for them. But a very good weekend for them. One they very much needed indeed. Aston Martin, let's talk about them now. I think they will be relatively satisfied with how this weekend went down, in particular for Fernando Alonso. It's not the podium that they have been oh so accustomed to over the last few races of the 2023 season. But they did have some issues in quali. Both sessions, they had an issue with the DRS on both cars, which obviously prevented them from putting together the laps that they would have wanted to. And of course, you don't want to lose DRS at this circuit more than others. But the race pace was pretty handy. Fernando Alonso managing his race very, very well, getting up to P4 quite comfortably, almost pipping Charles Leclerc at the end for P3. But, you know, sometimes you've got to hold your hand up and say he was a better driver on the day, all things considered. And Lance Stroll, bit of a mixed bag there as well, but I think he'll be pretty happy with his performance. I think P6 was it, uh, P sorry, sorry P, uh, well, was it? Just trying to check the result. P7 in the main race. P7. I've got loads of different screenshots to remind myself of the results here just to make sure I'm keeping tabs of it. But yeah, P7 in the main race today for Lance Stroll and P8 in the sprint. So some good points for him as well. I think the most interesting part of the race uh, that we saw from Fernando Alonso is something we have seen a lot of him this year is this desire and willingness to give his teammate coaching advice on how to get the most out of this car whilst he's driving the race himself. Now, we often associate Fernando Alonso as being one of those drivers with 300 IQ plays in Formula 1 and an incredible mental capacity beyond so many other people that drive cars at at an elite level to be able to do all these random things and still be able to drive a race car really, really quickly. Um, The one particular moment, Lee, saying on the radio to um, well to his engineer as a message to Lance Stroll to adjust his brake bias to the one that Fernando was using to get more comfort in driving the car now of course we don't know if that really worked for Lance Stroll because he he may have done that and then made a mistake which allowed Hamilton to overtake him make of that what you will but I just want to focus on the team play that we're seeing from Fernando Alonso right now Um, 
it's an incredible, incredible turn of events for Fernando. Something I don't think we've often associated with him as a team player, but uh, um, the guy never ceases to amaze us, really, quite frankly, does he? Yeah, well, on Fernando, firstly, the, the, his mental capacity is just amazing. Obviously, saying, oh, Lewis's tyres are graining in front of me. Um, Lance, adjust your brake strategy, and he might as well be talking to his race engineer about move pawn to D to <laughs> play <laughs> mental chess. Well, they just plug, just, like, him, just plug him into Fernando, isn't it? Like, if he wants to talk to his race engineer, like, just talk directly to Fernando. He can manage his strategies. He say, oh, yeah. you've got a box here. Do this, do that. He might as well do that. Maybe that'll be a thing one day in F1. Probably not a good idea, but uh, if anyone could do it, Fernando could, yeah. It's really impressive what he can do um, and his mental capacity. And uh, the observations, obviously, all the drivers have that level, uh, have a mental capacity to do the external observations. But Fernando, I think, is probably, he's probably still one of the, the best in the grid in doing that. Um, but yeah, he has a reputation for not being a team player with his drivers, the other driver or the engineers or in general. So, how friendly he is in coaching and almost training Lance, who's already been in the sport for, uh, for over five years? In development is not Lance isn't a rookie by any means. So he's like, I'll do this, do that, do this, do that. And I I I, I just wonder what what is Lawrence paying Fernando to be nice um <laughs> to Lance? Uh, no, I mean I mean just it's but not it, it's, enough whatever he's paying him if he is. <laughs> um it is just a, a driver of Fernando's level, you think how can he be any better? How can he be even a better racer? How much will we ensure? But Maybe he has matured now. He's in his forties to be. I'm not in a fight, championship fight. I'm going to be. We're going to be uh, playing together or racing together, and we're actually going to be teammates. It's still uh, a a really entertaining thing. I would really, really interested to see if that would last. If Aston Martin's got to the point they were fighting for race wins or more, yeah, for race wins first. <laughs> yeah, of course, of course, that's going to be the objective for Aston Martin. If that is something they could do this year, we'll have to wait and see. But uh, yeah, plenty going on there. As I said, another decent day for Aston Martin. Still currently P2 in the constructors. Fernando, P3 in the drivers. The Red Bulls are getting away now. So I think Fernando, if he hadn't already, his priorities are obviously going to be set on maintaining P3 at the very least. I think another strange story that we saw building up to this weekend, something I didn't believe at first when I was looking on social media, is the apparent rumours around Fernando Alonso's private life, where uh, it's rumoured that he's currently dating taylor swift or something going on there um look as far as the driver's personal life is concerned it's not something i really am that interested in this was a piece of information that you just couldn't really avoid on social media we saw crofty and karen chanduk having plenty of puns at play throughout this weekend regarding to some taylor swift songs um that were not very subtle at all if i'm honest in terms of addressing those rumors fernando alonso was often asked about this in the paddock i think will buxton uh, the f1 journalist was quite pressing on this and uh, i think fair to say that fernando was able to shake it off quite well so uh yeah before i get one of my own puns in there while i'm at it anyway let's move on to mercedes and um, yeah, well, we, we talked a lot about George Russell this weekend, um, in particular with Max Verstappen. In the race itself, he didn't have the best of restarts, which really compromised him. I think he said on the radio as well that it was a terrible restart, which saw him get overtaken by his teammate, Sir Lewis Hamilton. And then, of course, we had Hamilton himself, despite the issues that he had owing to the safety car, which obviously compromised him and Max Verstappen in particular. And what you know, you could argue cost Max the win. Lewis was able to recover rather well. And I think this is a very strong weekend in the race for Sir Lewis Hamilton. Bear in mind, Lee, this is a guy that, you know, bear, given the format that we'd found ourselves in with the sprint weekend, there wasn't a lot of time for Hamilton to really find the pace of this car in a way that he often likes to. It often takes him a little bit of time to build up his speed up until he absolutely has to. And then he's on it. Didn't have that luxury this weekend. But all things considered, I think he was bloody good and was very unlucky today not to be higher up than fifth. I think he could have been in that fight with Alonso and Leclerc today. Yeah, it, I, I think this is probably Lewis's best race of the season. Um, obviously, we've said in previous episodes that we've or we've talked about in previous episodes, I should say, the subject is George, the change of the guard at Mercedes, George now leading the Mercedes, George now putting all his tools set on display about he's going to be the leading driver going forward. And then we come to this weekend. Lewis, for the first time this season, is out qualified George. 
in the main qualifying, obviously in the sprint, it was so different. But in the the main event, um, he outscored George again, and so he's leading the obviously George in the in the championship standings, and you feel that Lewis is getting on top of his situation issues he had earlier in the season with how he's feeling in the car. Yes, it may be track specific, but you just feel. And we've said it before. Lewis always seems to start off a season slowly and builds, builds uh, as the season goes on. And you just feel in the Mercedes guy, Lewis is now building. He's building, and it's it's coming towards him more. Um, and it was a really impressive drive, especially after that restart. And it's like, oh, he's got he's sitting down in tenth. He's behind these two or three slow cars. That that has is mighty fast in a straight line. They were top of the speed traps. It's like, oh, that's going to be a pain to get past. Bam. Well, I didn't even see him clear the cars. <laughs> I don't think they ever showed a, a, a replay where he actually cleared um, Ocken and Holkenberg. No, after the didn't restart, know. we didn't see that. Um, no. So it's so like, when did that happen? Um, uh, so it was really impressive driving from from Lewis this weekend. Um, so I'd be really interested to see if he's keeping that can keep that momentum going forward. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, you know, Lewis was doing Lewis things, as we often know he can. And probably the most annoying part for him was the realisation that that Mercedes still has a lot of drag and aero efficiency to improve upon over the course of this season. I mean, how many times was he, not just the main race, but the sprint race as well, trying to overtake Carlos Sainz, but he just did not have the straight line speed to get past that Ferrari today. And arguably, if Hamilton had more performance or at least more aero efficiency, he probably would have got the job done. I think that probably was the reason Sainz finished ahead of Hamilton uh, in both races this weekend was for that. So he did a great job regardless. And it was great to see Lewis really on it this weekend. And, you know, look, I'm not suggesting here that, you know, Lewis hasn't been, but I think we saw the real Sir Lewis Hamilton come out this weekend and we saw more of the performance that we know he can produce and do things in that car that not many people on the grid can. So hopefully this is onwards and upwards for him. And, you know, he started to warm himself up and he's going to really give it his all this season and, and see where he ends up. It's, it's The championship is always richer when Sir Lewis Hamilton is, is on his A game. And, you know, that's what we want to see, regardless of where he finishes. We want to see him on it and enjoying himself, more importantly. And he certainly looked like he was doing that this weekend um quick one on George Russell as I said we already talked about him from that incident with Verstappen the sprint we part of this weekend went really well for George qualified p4 in the sprint shootout I think that was a great job all things considered to get on the second row of the grid and he finished in p4 despite that incident with Verstappen in the main race though obviously as you mentioned Lee out qualified by his teammate and knocked out by his teammate in q2 started 11th but got himself up into uh what was it p8 and got the fastest lap of the race as well so, some decent points there for George Russell, but um, it was a Saturday was a better day for him than Sunday and Friday was. Yeah, it 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 definitely for George. I think it was very much a what could have been um, if he could have had the performance he had showed on the Saturday qualifying or the sprint qualifying on Friday. He could have started up higher and then delivered the performance to um, obviously get more points um if he had better safety car restarts in the sprint and in the main event he could have obviously maintained more positions and not lost lose positions so it's very much for george i think it's very much a race or weekend of regrets of oh if i'd done this or done that or done this i could score better um and that is clearly highlighted he needs to improve on his safety car restarts because he, he didn't do well out of either of them in the sprint or the main event. Um, so just obviously something that he may need to review himself. Yeah, absolutely. Couldn't agree with me more on that, uh, you more on that one. Um, let's talk about McLaren quickly. Uh, McLaren, I think they'll be relatively happy with how this weekend went, especially if you're Lando Norris. He got some points in the race today, P9. Best of the rest, I think we can all agree he was absolutely brilliant in that car he was very much compromised heavily in the sprint he gambled on the soft tires didn't work out for him and obviously that was a very harsh lesson learned because the soft tires were not a very good race tire this weekend um, as they often have been in the past but not this weekend unfortunately for him and of course we had the debacle with uh, sprint quality he got into both q3 sessions so i think overall 
McLaren have made a step forward. McLaren are saying that they found about two temps per lap, uh, two temps of a second per lap with their new upgrades, with another two temps expected on their next batch of upgrades coming very, very soon. So in a way, Lee, that's probably catapulted them all the way from arguably P8 to uh, overall out of the 10 cars on the grid up to the point where they are challenging to be best of the rest with Alpine right now. And and in Norris's hands, he did a very, very good job. And I think Piastri did pretty handy as well. But um, obviously his race didn't go as well as Lando's did, for example. Yeah, I, I'm talking about it with you in the the preview that like, if maybe too early to say if the upgrades are working time to understand and you think the limited running they had, I think McLaren understood their upgrades because I wasn't expecting that level of performance um, this weekend. Um, from them and it was it was nice to see that that in what Zach Brown had said previously about the updates that their their season will start from when the upgrades come I can understand that they feel like where they've left off last season now just had the three races in between that or they were inconvenient <laughs> because it left McLaren at towards the back um, apart from Melbourne where it went really went their way uh, for other reasons but you definitely feel they've taken a step forward to the point that Alpine may be concerned because Alpine are having a lot of bad luck and Alpine obviously thinking that's our spot in the championship for fifth. But the performance of this weekend, um, I don't think Alpine have much of a chance against the McLaren at the moment because Alpine just seem to be self-destructing. Yeah, uh, speaking of which, um, it is. Co- I think we should mention something on this new sprint format that there did seem to be a few occasions where teams might be taking liberties on the the risk of certain situations being um, exacerbated worse than probably the FIA would like because of the fact that we only had one practice session available. And, and in particular with Pierre Gasly's incident where his car basically blew up and he was trying to bring it back to the pit lane rather than pull over as he normally would do. Is there a fear that if this is left unchecked, teams are going to take liberties on certain incidents to a degree where this could get worse? I mean, we saw Sonoda in... Um, what was it? Was it the sprint race where he came back out and he was basically doing yeah. a permanent drift all the way round purely because Alpha Terry wanted to try and send him out and collect data. And then, of course, he ended up losing his will. So for me, I, I do feel that something needs to be done here because teams, you know, teams will push this to the nth degree, but it may not necessarily be in the best interest of safety right now. Yeah, I would, we've said it before that data is uh, data. Engineers love data. Get the right way around. Engineers love data. So you've taken away the the data gathering exercises from the team removing their practice sessions. But their desire for data hasn't gone. Um, so especially in the sprint, as you've already mentioned, for the back of the grid, you, there's no reward from it. So you can use it as a data gathering exercise. You don't want to retire early because you want to maximize your data. So you send the car out. And I, I think teams will take advantage of it until there's either a rule put in place or a punishment put in place for unsafe release of a damaged car or continue driving with. I think um, Alpha Terry were penalised for uh, releasing Yuki within, in the, with the damage he had. Um, but the team will still do it again. Then you pay, I can't know what the fine was, but you pay 10,000 euros and yeah, that was worth the data for the half a lap or whatever. Um, so it is, I definitely think it will become a bigger problem. Yeah, I mean... We saw last season a few teams trying to take liberties on, you know, safety, sending their cars out when they're not in a good condition. I mean, we saw AlphaTauri do this last year as well at Baku with Sonoda. I think, didn't they have a DRS issue or something like that? And they had to use um, some very special tape. Um, I can't remember what they call it, performance tape or something like that, where they had to stay, keep it shut and send him out. And obviously it wasn't really working. It was a bit strange. It wasn't really safe. I think that's how I remember it, right? I might be wrong. Yeah. But um yeah, I agree. I just feel that because of the condensed weekend format that we have in terms of gathering data in practice, that as a, as a sort of, and of course, you know, they didn't want the red flag with Gasly, if we're talking about Alpine in particular, they didn't want to cause a red flag and they wanted to try and get him back to the pits. But obviously that car was on fire. You don't, you don't want him driving that back. You want him to stop it and get it out. So I do feel with this new format, the FIA do have to be quite strict on certain regulations on how teams have to handle certain situations. Um, as I said, nobody wants to be in a situation where there's a red flag and we lose the entirety of time that practice is available and then the weekend is kind of a bit of a lottery, if you like. But at the same time, driver safety has to come first. So we shall see how that develops in the coming weeks on what the reflection is on that. 
Let's talk briefly about Alpine's weekend in particular. Um, Ocon and, and Hulkenberg as well, we should, should mention in both, had to start from the pit lane. They were on the hard tyres to begin with. They went practically a full race distance because the, the safety car came out too early. So they wouldn't have been able to change tyres that would have allowed them to not stop again. And Hulkenberg's race was practically ruined despite running in the points really well. Ocon, the same thing as well. But at the same time, Lee, the big issue that happened towards the end of the race was Ocon trying to pit on the on the penultimate lap of the race. We had loads of photographers trying to get across to get ready to take photos in the middle of the pit lane area. Some of them in the actual pit lane whilst the live race was going on. They were trying to shut the pit lane entry whilst Leclerc was about to make his pit stop. We had Red Bull mechanics and crew trying to climb over the fence and the FIA actually were trying to outlaw this. So I don't know what they're going to make of all of that. And then Ocon comes to the pit lane and all we see was video footage of Ocon coming in at speed. He has no idea the people are there. And they're scrambling to get out of the way as he's coming into the pit lane at speed. I mean, a crazy incident. And I can honestly say that whilst some people are obviously going to have their own opinions on this, it's a very bad look for Formula One and the FIA right now when we were getting warning about this on the broadcast with Ted Kravitz that Sky F1 was talking about this and the commentary team. And then it happens once again, we've got a situation like this where it just feels that F1 and the FIA, they're not prioritising the real issues here. And they get very, very lucky that someone doesn't get seriously hurt by this. Yeah, I, I think obviously they, they have a procedure at the end of a, a race where how they set up for the 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 top three um, when they come in after the race is finished. But clearly that process broke down and someone hadn't thought that a car I hadn't realized a car hadn't stopped and opened up. I don't know if that's managed by Formula One or the FA or actually the the ground um the organizer. Um so I I don't know if Baku's been brought towards the streets like Melbourne was uh, <laughs> uh four weeks ago. Um but it's it was disgraceful and it could have been so much worse. Um uh, thankfully it wasn't um but they just can't let it happen again if you have to ruin the spectacle of TV that you can't start closing, having people in the pit lane until the checkered flag is waved, then fine, do that. You have, it's, they just can't risk people's safety, driver safety. Um, whatever went wrong in that moment, um, it should never happen again. Yeah, and, and you and because of how quick an F1 race can be, or at least an F1 lap can be, you don't have much time to issue out any communication on these things to a mass amount of people that obviously felt that they weren't expecting a Alpine to come into the pits the lap before the end. They all obviously want to get ready and everything else with that. I do think they have to take a hard stance on this and that this is still a live pit lane. You can't be doing these things. Both that incident and with the Red Bull mechanics going to the pit wall to celebrate Perez and Max finishing one, two, they're linked in that regard because it was still a live pit lane. You know, we can't leave them out of this. Obviously, you know, Christian Horner said, all oh, the incidents aren't really linked and they follow the rules properly. Well, I suppose we'll have to wait and see how that goes down. The FIA have conducted an investigation has marked their own homework, as it were. And basically, they've gone as far as saying, if I got this right, that the FIA representatives in the statement have expressed their regret at what happened and assured us that they would do so in time for the next event in terms of making sure the correct protocols are in place for this not to happen again. Now, that's one thing. We all know what happens when the FIA mark their own homework on these things. They never find themselves at fault, or at the very least, they acknowledge something wasn't right and they'll get it right next time. We saw a very similar situation happen at Melbourne last year with Alex Albon, if you remember, Lee, where he had to pit on the fin- uh, the penultimate lap because he went all the way round uh, on a set of hard tyres and he had to pit in order to not get disqualified and there were people coming through the pit lane and they had to get out of his way whilst he was going through a live pit lane so you know forgive me if I'm being blunt here and I'm picking a particular example of another issue out of thin air which is a low priority it feels to me that the FIA and in particular I'm gonna not call him out but I'm gonna bring him up in this Mohammed Ben Salayim because this is something that he has been very heavy handed on since he has been the FIA president I feel that right now he needs, and the FIA needs to stop being obsessed about silly little pointless rules like worrying about which driver has a nose stud 
um, in on them or other piercings or anything like that before going into a race and going through this old merry-go-round over nothing really when this driver in particular has doctor's notes and stuff like that to say they need to keep it in for health reasons and everything, all that comes with it, and actually focused on my, the more important issues like this, making sure that a live racetrack is free of any journalists or photographers or VIP guests trying to roam around in areas they shouldn't be because they're at huge risk of getting seriously hurt or worse. That has to be the priority because quite frankly, right now, with all due respect to Mohammed Ben Salim, his presidency is more remembered for those little silly issues and worrying about that, which isn't really relevant to anything that's important. And there is the potential that if something goes seriously wrong here or someone gets hurt, that's what his presidency tenure is going to be remembered for. And I'm pre- and not to mention the Abu Dhabi thing as well, if we're going to go back there even further. So that needs to be addressed, quite frankly. And I sincerely hope that they start taking this seriously. I just get fed up that the FIA are not proactive on these issues and are reactive, not even reactive, because they need multiple reminders to do something before they actually do something. So, uh, yeah, small rant over. I'm just, I just get fed up of seeing this stuff all the time happen and people just act so blasé as like, oh, well, you know, we'll learn from this, we'll get it right next time. And then it happens again. And then they just say the same old rubbish and they mark their own homework, if you're right, if you like. Perhaps we do need to get an independent a body in place to investigate these issues so that the FIA can't just do these silly things, mark their own homework and say, oh, well, we'll do better next time and then just don't do it. Yeah, maybe we should just allow the media onto the track on the uh, on the warm down lap, you know, just get them go up to the cars, they're going around and take pictures. Oh, why not? Just in the middle of the race, just get them to go out, run across the track, take a picture, a close up and well, climb on a car, get a lift yeah. round. Why not? <laughs> you know, you might as well. It'd be quite interesting to see Karen Chanduk or Crofty just running out with, or Damon Hill today. He was doing the post race interviews and Naomi Swift with the uh, sprint race. Just get them to climb on a random car and just like, right, let's have an interview while you're driving around. Do your victory lap. I mean, it's crazy. Honestly, it's 2023. And this is something that we all know. Anyone with any common sense knows that this is a silly idea. Uh, to allow journalists and photographers. Look, Ocon said in his post-race interview, Lee, when they asked him about it, it's like, why is there such a rush to do all this? Like, we have time. Like, the final part of the weekend is the F1 race. Of course, the teams and that have to pack up their equipment and everything else, and broadcasters want to get stuff done to a time. You can wait a few minutes for the race to finish, then go and do all the media stuff. I do feel like priorities are in the wrong place right now, and if they're not careful, someone's going to get really hurt. And then what do you do? Unfortunately, I I don't expect much when it comes to the FA in these regards, and I don't think much will change until, unfortunately, someone does get hurt. I hope that isn't the case, but um, that's just my gut feeling on it. Yeah, we'll have to wait and see on that one. Um, you know, we'll talk about a few other weekends. Obviously, Williams, not some bad performances there. You know, Sargent was doing well this weekend. Gasly, I'm pretty sure he was sick of the sight of the rear end of Logan Sargent this weekend in the race. Of course, very unlucky in qualifying with an incident that he had, which really bogged him down, but uh, not a bad drive nonetheless. Alex Albon, another strong performance from him. So I think uh, this weekend, so Williams, I think they'll be pretty happy with that. Although I don't think Williams scored any points at the end of it, unfortunately, but still another solid performance from them. Certainly making ways up the midfield. So good for them. Haas as well. Similar performance for them. Hulkenberg doing pretty well in the race. Magnussen, obviously, in the sprint. Um, the strategy didn't work out for Hulkenberg in the sprint race. I've obviously, he was having setup issues. That's why he started at the back. Bit of a concern for Alfa Romeo right now. They're uh, not reliable. They're not quick. Bottas is struggling for pace compared to his teammate. I think the only highlight Alfa Romeo can look at right now is the fact that Joe Guan Yu is at the very least, keeping up with his teammate, if not outperforming him. And Teo Portrera in F2 is still doing very, very good things there. So, you know, we'll have to... Uh, I think we'll talk about Bottas in a future episode because there is a, definitely a concern there with his form. I did want to focus, though, on Alpha Tauri because we've got Yuki Tsunoda, once again, doing really good things there right now. He's really coming of age. He's showing his experience, his maturity. He's showing his speed. He's a lot more consistent. Another point today in the main race some very good laps in qualifying he got in q3 in the sprint shootout as well uh, no sorry no he didn't he got in q3 was it the main qualifying session oh come on i'd get it right um i'm scrolling no. through just to make sure no sorry forgive me guys um 
he was uh, P8 in qualifying. That's where uh, he finished up in the main race. But obviously the sprint one, he uh, was uh, didn't quite make it a Q3, but he was another driver that could have missed out with the soft tyre issue. So Sonoda, very strong weekend from him. Nick DeVries, however, definitely a concern because, I mean, if we want to, you know, paint his weekend or describe how his weekend went, he crashed out in sprint qualifying. He wasn't very quick in the sprint race, finished last of all. He was quite s- slow in the um, in the main qualifying session and he crashed out in the race. Very rookie errors from Nick DeVries. Now, we can give him the benefit of the doubt, Lee, and say that this is his first season, needs to find his feet. It's not an easy car to get on top of right now, so you can see the parity between himself and Yuki Tsunoda, who's a few years more experienced in F1 than he is. But Nick DeVries is not an inexperienced driver. He has experience of driving Formula 1 cars. He's 27 years of age now, so, you know, he has time. He's had plenty of time driving in these uh, elite-level machinery. So I do feel that... Even though we all said in our predictions video, Lee, that um, Nick DeVries wasn't likely to be in a position where he may lose his seat or any driver was to lose his seat halfway through the season. But Red Bull will be keeping an eye on this. And I don't know how much control they have over Nick DeVries' position in the AlphaTauri team, especially given the rumours about AlphaTauri's future in F1 or a potential sale that may or may not happen. We don't know this right now. And with Franz Tost leaving the team... They do have a driver in Liam Lawson that's racing in Super Formula in Japan right now and is going pretty well. And a lot of people believe he is the next guy that's going to be in an Alpha Tower at some point. It does feel right now that if things continue the way they are, that there could be some level of risk that we may see a driver change halfway through the season if Nick DeVries doesn't show some tangible improvements anytime soon. Yeah, with, with Nick, it was a bit of an, an uh, appalling weekend, especially a different category, but being a Formula E world champion and Formula E predominantly race on the street circuits. So this kind of mistakes that Nick made, you feel he shouldn't have been, um, he should be experienced enough to not have done those mistakes because he wouldn't have done it in Formula E. Yes, different card, different speeds, but he's a world champion who predominantly has raced on street circuits on another category. So it does feel a bit silly. Um, I don't think Nick should be worried yet, but he, I definitely agree that he needs to improve or very quickly or he will be um, looked to being booted. Um, the other drivers in their past, I suppose, I'm not sure on the rookie season though, but younger drivers, I know he's not younger either, but inexperienced drivers, let me put that, inexperienced Formula 1 drivers, there you go, opens up a bit better, um, have crashed on street circuits and I'm just going to use Charles and Max at Monaco. They loved crashing at Monaco in multiple sessions in their earlier days. Um, so it Nick can improve. Um, obviously, we go into another street circuit and um, as long as he doesn't crash. But he, he can improve. But if he doesn't, he's definitely going to be on the, the chopping block because we know how red, ruthless this Rebel Junior program is. Um and yeah, it's they only have a certain limit before they uh, start cutting drivers. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, there are a few prospects waiting in the wings. As I said, we already mentioned Liam Lawson. We've got Ayumu Wasa, who's doing rather well in F2 at the moment. Uh, it wasn't his best weekend this weekend, but, you know, otherwise still pretty strong in that championship. So there are options for Red Bull right now. And look, I, I want to back Nick DeVries, and I certainly hope he can turn things around. But... You know, it does get to a point, as you mentioned, Lee, already, that Red Bull can be very unforgiving in their academy. And if their drivers aren't performing, especially to the degree that Nick is right now, that is certainly something that he will be very, very concerned about now. Um, as a final thought, we should off. We should say congratulations, Lee, on your bold predictions. As you mentioned earlier, um, you got that spot on. You got a safety car in both the sprint race and the main race. So uh, a nice bonus five points for you. Turns out that uh, safety cars aren't that unsurprising in Baku, in all fairness. But still, you know, I think that's a pretty solid prediction from you. Yeah, well, I was more... I know I was expecting a safety car, but I think the bigger surprise was safety car in a sprint race. Because I don't think we've had a safety car 
in a sprint race before this weekend. I, at least not off the top of my head. No, I can't think of one either. I, for some reason, I was thinking of Imola last year, but I don't think that was. I think there was just a wet, dry race. It just felt like there was a safety car in it, but I don't think there was, quite frankly. I don't think there was. Mm. I don't, uh, Obviously, correct us if um, I'm Maybe wrong. I I'm, I'm feel like there was, but I can't remember. I mean, Mick no. Schumacher did he? Was that the one that he could? No, it wasn't. No, it was 2021 when he did that when he crashed in Imola. Um, I don't know. I feel like there was in that race, but you might be right. And you know, fair enough. Fair enough. I can't argue with that. It was a very bold prediction. So well done, you mate. Um, I think I went with double points, McLaren. I have to go back and check. Anyway, guys, look, I think we've. Uh, uh, we've dragged this out long enough. There was a lot to cover in this one, so I do appreciate you guys sticking around for us for the duration. But let us know your thoughts on all the topics that we have discussed in this episode for F1's first sprint weekend of 2023. Let us know in the comments section your thoughts on the topics we discussed or anything that we may have missed in particular. Of course, don't forget if you are new to subscribe to the channel, like the video, and also don't forget to give us a five-star review on your favorite podcasting platform. It really helps us out a lot. And of course, we will give you a shout out on a future episode. But until next time, guys, we will be back for the preview of the Miami Grand Prix. F1 returns to Miami. And of course, there will be water in the marina, sun in the sky, and I hope that we will get another incredible race in this 2023 World Championship. But until next time, take care. Please stay safe. And we will see you in the next episode of the DNF1 F1 podcast. And remember, as always, if you're not first, you're probably DNF1. Take care, guys. Goodbye.